It's my great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker tonight, um, Ann Solomon, Dr. Ann Solomon. She comes to us from up north, from O Canada. <laughs> um, she had to, to take a passport with her to get here. <laughs> um, Ann and I uh, go back kind of a long ways. Uh, we met each other when we were younger uh, graduate students and have a sort of a long shared history together of rabble rousing in science and, and, and playing by the water side, if you will. Um, Anne Solomon is uh, an associate professor at Simon Fraser University up in British Columbia in Vancouver. And um, she has been doing some of the most innovative work right now in thinking about natural ecological systems and their relationship to people and how people relate to those ecosystems. Um, she's been a pioneer of bringing in uh, social sciences into natural sciences um, and really doing uh, interdisciplinary work that is, is changing the face of marine ecology, in my opinion. <laughs> now she's going to be embarrassed. <laughs> um, she, had, uh, she started her education at Queen's University. Uh, she got her Bachelor of Science there. Uh, she got a Master's of Science degree at the University of British Columbia and her PhD at the University of Washington. And she, um, let's see, she's published a few papers, just a couple. She's also published a really wonderful book, um, which this was back in 2011, based on her dissertation work, which she did up in the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. And she worked together with uh, tribal communities there and looked at, um, uh, the ecology of a particular um, marine invertebrate called a chitin. Um, and she wrote a book about it, and it was published in 2011. It's called Ima Imam Simiusia, Our Changing Sea. And that's in, and I'm, I'm going to mangle it, Anne. Um, I'm not going to remember the name of it. Anyway, um, she'll tell you a little more about that. But the book won two awards. Uh, won the Alaska Library Association's Alaskana Award for its significant literary contribution to the understanding of Alaska and Alaskan history. And it also was a winner of the National Association of Government Communicators Award um, for best book. So she speaks English, <laughs> um, which, is, which is really good for us. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you about her is that she's won a number of uh, awards and honors already for her, um, uh, she's, she's just recently been tenured as an associate professor, so she's actually quite um, advanced in, in, in her accolades. So in 2013, she was named a Pew Fellow. It's one of the highest honors in conservation biology and marine sciences. Um, in 2013, she also re, real, um, uh, got an international recognition of professional excellence from the International Ecology Institute. And in 2015, she won an award for excellent in graduate supervision at Simon Fraser University, so her students love her. And I hope you will enjoy her presentation at well. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Anne Solomon. She's going to be talking to you today about adapting to surprise in our coastal ocean, lessons from ecology, archaeology, and indigenous knowledge. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming this evening, and thank you, Karina, for the embarrassingly warm welcome. Um, really, my name's Anne, I'm a marine ecologist, and I, I started to just really have a passion for understanding how people and ocean systems interacted, and that's why I'm standing here. I think, like many of you in this room, probably share a similar passion. So, ecological surprises. They challenge scientists, but they also challenge society. And yet they've done so for thousands and thousands of years. Emerging evidence from the field of marine ecology has pointed to the, the prevalence of what are called regime shifts, which is a fancy word for just describing really rapid changes in ecosystems. But those rapid changes in ecosystems can have very profound and very prolonged consequences for society. So tonight what I want to do is I want to share with you 
some of the little bits of insight that my students and I have been learning about these ecosystem tipping points in marine systems and what they mean to people, how people have been adapting to some of these very big changes that can happen in our coastal oceans. And I'm gonna do that through the lens not only of marine ecology, but of archeology span and indigenous knowledge. Okay, so ecosystems across the world have exhibited tipping points. Tropical reefs are a really good example. You can picture some tropical reefs that are coral dominated that can suddenly flip into algal dominated states. And they can be reversible. You can see these systems flip back, but it's often a lot trickier. Open ocean systems like this system that's dominated by Atka mackerel can flip into systems that are dominated by jellyfish. And a little closer to home, temperate rocky reefs like the reefs you have here in Northern California that I have in British Columbia and that also exist in Alaska can sh shift from these forested states to these urchin barren states. And um, this is a little clip from the Press Democrat, which I received about 10 days ago, so April 16th, that describes some of these very rapid shifts. So here you're learning about the collapse of kelp forest that imperils North Coast ocean ecosystems. In your very backyard, some of these dramatic shifts are happening. Large tracts of kelp forest that once blanketed the sea off the north coast have vanished over the past two years. A startling transformation that scientists say stem from rapid ecological change that has potential far-reaching impacts, including that valuable fisheries. So the topic I'm talking about today is playing out within your backyard right now. Now, these regime shifts, like I said, um, They've been documented across a variety of marine systems, but we actually know very little about the nature of these shifts, what really make them tick, and therefore we have a very um, tricky uh, situation because we can't predict exactly when they're gonna happen. And unveiling some of the mysteries of these regime shifts involve not only knowing about the ecosystem, but also about the social system in which these interactions that cause tips are embedded. So when I think of rocky reef e ecosystems like these kelp forests that can transition to urchin barrens, I think of them as just one small little component of a much larger complex system, a complex adaptive system with reciprocal interactions that's depicted by those pink arrows there between three variables, ecosystems, a group of people interacting, or a social system, and that system of social control within which those interactions take place, a management system. And many people that are trying to understand the dynamics of these complex adaptive systems are calling these social ecological systems. Simply put, it's just linked systems of people in nature. These, these complex systems, despite being complex, share several key features. First off, they're always changing, they're dynamic, and so they're rarely at equilibrium. And this is an assumption that many ecological models make. So it defies some of our basic assumptions in ecology. They're rife with uncertainty, and that means that they're very difficult to predict. They also display these things called tipping points or non-linearities, regime shifts, where tiny little changes can have big impacts. And we tend to see all sorts of interactions across space and time. So what that means is that it's very difficult to try and predict the interactions in these systems, let alone control them with management and conservation. And so what I hope to do today is to convince you that rather than trying to control these systems with traditional conservation management, top-down command and control strategies, instead what we should try and do is understand the factors that promote their resilience. And that is their ability to respond to external shocks to the system, learn, reorganize, and adapt to essentially maintain the same function. So 
Given that introduction, I thought I'd share with you the basic overarching questions that motivate my work and the work of uh, my students. We're really interested in understanding when, where, and to what extent and under what conditions did these tipping points or regime shifts occur? What factors actually confer resilience to these systems? And when they do tip, when they do transform into a whole new system, how can systems adapt to these dramatic changes? So what I want to do is I want to explore these questions with you by way of three examples, um, which I think are highly relevant to the north coast of California. We're going to dive into kelp forest systems. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about ancient clam gardens up in British Columbia, and finally, Pacific herring fishery. So I'm gonna give you three vignettes and at the end draw on some of the lessons learned from these three vignettes. Okay, let's start off with kelp forests. I sense that many of you here know that kelp forests are one of the world's most productive ecosystems. They also encompass about 40% of the world's ecoregions. So these are very important systems. What many of you may not know is that there's archaeological evidence from various island archipelagos. And right now, you're looking at the islands of Haida Gwaii, formerly known as the Queen Charlotte Islands, located off the north coast of Vancouver, um, the, west, the north coast, northwest coast of British Columbia. This is a remote island archipelago. And it's also the site of archaeological records that date back to roughly 11,000 years of human occupation. And data from these sites identify the strong and continual use of kelp forest associated species from mammals like sea otters, harbor seals, river otters, and sea lions to fish, kelp forest associated fish. And in this case, what you're looking at, that big white bar, those are rockfish. And this is a rockfish vertebrae in this midden. And what you can see is that people made use of these kelp forest associated species for a very long time. So evidence from Haida Gwaii, and there's Haida Gwaii, just to put it in, in uh, place for you guys, and sites from other really old shell middens in North America have provided archaeologists with evidence to suggest that kelp forests and all the associated resources and ecosystem processes likely supported some of the earliest coastal migration routes of maritime people to the Americas. And this was at the end of the Pleistocene, roughly 12,000 years ago. So what that means is that humans have been interacting with, exploiting, over-exploiting, learning, and adapting to these kinds of ecosystems for thousands of years. So tipping points aren't that new to science, really, if you look back in the archaeological record. And there are strong socioeconomic and cultural trade-offs associated with some of these tipping points. And I'm just going to give you a sense of them here. In these forested sites, one tends to see greater habitat complexity, which can often provide greater ha habitat for fish. Not all fish, but some fish. You tend to also see greater organic carbon in the system, which can often fuel what scientists call secondary production, and all that means is anything greater than a primary producer, all the things that we tend to eat in systems or make use of, different animals that eat the plants in the ocean. They calm waves, and when you calm waves, you can also increase larval retention of the tiny little pelagic larvae or open ocean larvae of things like urchins and abalone that can then land, find a place to settle, grow up, and become part of that community. And they, of course, also sequester atmospheric carbon. These urchin barren sites are sites where one often sees high densities and high biomass of shellfish which provide food and food security for local communities, particularly those that can't move very far from home. They often encompass endangered species like northern abalone in British Columbia. And they provide a home for culturally and commercially important shellfish. So one often sees trade-offs associated with regime shifts because some species and some people stand to benefit 
and some species and some people stand to lose. So what we've been asking specifically in kelp forests is when and where and to what extent do they occur? What are the implications of these tipping points? And how do people actually cope with them? So now I want to take you to the central coast of British Columbia, um, where otters started recovering in about 1989. And I want to also share with you that I'm talking about the area just north of Vancouver Island and just south of Haida Gwaii. Like I was talking about with Bill in the um, Marine Tiburon Center just a few hours ago, there are no roads past Lund. So let me just point that out. This whole area is roadless. You can't access this coast unless you go by boat or by plane. This is uh, an amazingly remote area and an incredibly beautiful area. So our work there um, makes use of this gradient in sea otter occupation time. So we have 20 sites along this occupation time gradient in the recovery of otters which allows us to use this technique in science called a space for time substitution, and therefore allows us to look at tipping points in time, but actually using different sites in space. And the first thing we thought we'd do is get a handle on our major predator, the sea otter, at just a subset of these sites, five sites here. And what you're looking at is the fraction of different prey groups in the diet of otters, of what they were putting in their mouths, across five sites that vary in occupation time. A really early occupied site that's occupied for way less than a year, two years, up to 33 years. These different colors represent different kinds of animals that they're putting in their mouths. And the main pattern that I want to point out is that Immediately when otters get to a site, they're focusing on readily available red sea urchins. They're calorically rich, they're easy to collect. And then as they move on, they're moving from mollusks like abalone and chitons to bivalves like clams. And then they get pretty desperate and they're more focusing on intertidal small invertebrates like shore crabs and mussels. So not only is there a shift in the relative proportion of different prey items, but also the size of those prey items and the habitats in which they live. We also documented the rate at which they were putting urchins in their mouth. And the reason we did that is because urchins are known as very important grazers. In fact, they're universally the most important grazer on temperate reefs, known to be a big part of triggering these regime shifts. And as you can see, there's a dramatic exponential decline in the rate at which they're eating urchins through time. And after about three years, they've almost cleaned out those urchins in terms of the rate at which they're putting them in their mouths. So now I want to take you underwater. So this is a picture of what a, a whole bunch of sites look like after otters have been there from zero to 33 years. And you can see that very, very strong change in urchin density after three years. It is such a pronounced change that in Canada, we call it the hockey stick graph. And underwater, again, if you look at kelp abundance, you can see this threshold of roughly about five urchins that you've got to reduce your urchins to to start recovering a kelp forest. The other thing that we've noticed is that we're changing for kelp forests from young kelp forests to old growth kelp forests. Bull kelp, Neriocystis, it's an annual, it grows very, very quickly. And these bull kelp forests that we see after they've been um, exposed to sea, sea otters and their foraging on sea urchins for some time are slowly changing into perennial macrocystis or giant kelp forests. And let me show you a map that really proves that point. This is work by a PhD student of mine, Jen Burt. The orange colors are giant kelp and the greenish colors are bull kelp, the annual. And here's a map of the McMullen Island group in 1993, remember otters came to this area in 1989, and this is what it looks like in 2007. An increase in kelp forests, but also a shift in the kinds of kelp we see there, the um, nature of those kelps, and thus the productivity of the system. So what does that mean for the rest of the system? Another student of mine, Josh, and local community member, Patrick, 
found um, data to support this notion that sea otter occupation time was probably one of the biggest factors driving copper rockfish biomass. And if you look at the specific habitat variables, it turns out that the proportion of canopy forming kelp on rocky reefs was a factor that was driving much of these interactions. So the more uh, canopy forming kelp you have on a rocky reef, the higher rate at which you can actually fish copper rockfish biomass. We did not see those same effects for other rockfish species. It was just the copper rockfish. And of course, not all species benefit. The direct effects of sea otters on northern abalone are very, very strong. This is work by um, several collaborators, including my PhD student, Lynn Lee. And what you're looking at here are many, many sites in three regions. Haida Gwaii, the islands I mentioned earlier, where otters have not existed since the fur trade. By the way, Haida Gwaii was one of the very first sites um, uh, encountered by Juan Perez in 1774. We were just talking about that earlier. The central coast where there's about a thousand otters that have been there for about 33 years and the west coast of Vancouver Island, which many of you may have heard of, much more accessible, less remote. There are about 5,000 otters there that were uh, translocated by people. And what you can see, there are fewer abalone. This is abalone density as you increase the number of otters. But what you're also seeing with each site are these bars, right? These are means, but these bars here represent the variation at each site. And what that means is there's high, high site variability that has nothing to do with otters and has a lot to do with the amount of crevices in the area and habitat. So it turns out that certainly sea otters decrease the density and the size of abalone, but they also increase their cryptic behavior. They start hiding in cracks and thus are protected from other predators. And because you've got otters there, fewer urchins, you have much more kelp, that kelp actually increases the uh, amount of hiding spots, but also the amount of food. So you have these indirect benefits of sea otters on abalone. The, those sea otters also decrease mesopredators like tiny crabs, which can have high impacts on tiny little baby abalone. So these kinds of species interactions really challenge the simple expectations of what happens when predators come into a system. Okay, now I wanna show you some really cool data worked up by another student of mine, Gabby, who's holding my son here, Sam. It's the only picture I have of Gabby, but I couldn't help but squeeze in a picture of Sam. Um, and what you're looking at is a graph of stable isotope data. They help record, kind of like a flight recorder, what different consumers or animals are eating. Nitrogen tells you a little bit about the trophic level, which is basically a fancy word to describe who eats who. So predators, top level predators would be up high and primary producers or plants would be down low. And here, carbon, this del C13 here, represents the source of carbon. Now I want you to keep your eyes on this. Um, what you're looking at is the whole food web from lingcod to rockfish to pycnopodia, the sunflower star, all of which you have here. Caliostoma, a beautiful snail. Um, red sea urchins. And this is at a short occupation, a set of short occupation sites where otters have only been there for 0.1 to 2 years. This is what this food web looks like after medium occupation time. And this is what it looks like after 17 to 33 years. You see the dramatic shift in that food web. And if I lay them all top on top of each other, this is what you see with low, intermediate, and high occupation times. So big shifts in the food web. So what does that mean for people? As one of my dear friends and collaborators, Barb Wilson, Kailju says, it's a challenge for coastal communities, but we both have the right to food. This is um, a complex adaptive system, but with key interactions. And some of our science is starting to reveal some of the direct and indirect effects, both the benefits and the costs of having these predators back in a system. And yet, just like I started off with this presentation, this isn't new. 
right? I mean, humans have been interacting with sea otters for thousands of years. So in order to figure out how to adapt to these big changes that are happening in BC, that I know are also happening here in California, what we did is we pulled together First Nations, Native community members, leaders and elders from Alaska that have experienced sea otter um, occupation for over 50 years. Um, the Central Coast, First Nations there, the Heltzik who experienced otters for about 30 years the New Chalneth, who have experienced otters for about 40 years, and the Haida and southern New Chalneth that have not yet experienced the recovery of otters. And we brought together those leaders from those communities and scientists, marine ecologists, social scientists who study governance, um, and oceanographers to discuss some of these issues to start understanding how people can adapt. And what I wanna do is just give you a sense of this meeting. I'm just going to run this video for just about three minutes to actually give you a sense of voices other than mine and voices of my major collaborators and First Nation collaborators on this project. It's what I imagine a cloud would feel like soft as uh, eagle down. Special animals that only chiefs and their hunters were permitted to take. We were very prized in terms of uh, the, the pelt. Only hot wear or people of high standing were ever ever had them. The sea otter in our language is called quat quat. We say quat quat. Try not to ask me how to spell it. The, the sea otter, um, we call it clue. I believe that sea, the sea otter has a place in our environment. They play a role where kelp forests are growing. Um, we know that without the sea otter, uh, kelp forests would be overtaken by sea urchins. But we have to learn how to maintain that balance. The relationships between people, kelp forests, and sea otters have literally spanned millennia. And there are actually governance practices in place that manage these relationships. But the fur trade, it changed all that. Not only did it cause the elimination of sea otters, it caused an increase in their prey. Shellfish, sea urchins, abalone, clams and cockles, crabs. All of those prey became increasingly more available and we became increasingly more reliant on them. Not only for food, food to feed our families, but for jobs, for our livelihoods. And so with the return of sea otters now, and the decline in some of those same shellfish prey that we love to eat, that we depend on for you know, economic value, for cultural value, that's caused a real conflict. The d return of the sea otter certainly raises the kinds of issues that require people to think really carefully about how they manage local ocean spaces around them and whether or not they want to have shellfish uh, because we know that the return of the sea otters will reduce the amount of shellfish that is available and beginning to ask these questions in another way say well wait a minute what do we really want here and that sounds like it will call for and certainly uh, benefit from the reassertion of territorial rights on the part of the the first nations groups in this area traditionally uh, we had people who were responsible for taking care of the resources and when the sea otter was abundant in our territory, uh, this family would be uh, charged with protecting our clam beaches, our, um, our crab uh, harvesting areas. 
the old days on Haida Gwaii. Sea otter were uh, hunted in uh, by by chiefs and their and their hunters in their own territories. The uh, men used ceremony before they went out, and then they would use small small canoes that would go through the kelp easily, and they would use spears or clubs. The sea otters were used as um, dress for the, um, they were called Lana Auga, our, our um, head chiefs, and they would be also used as wall covering in, during the winters to keep to keep the people inside the house warm and they would be used as um, bedding. We looked at um, the... I'm gonna let you watch the rest of the video on your time. This is a short documentary and you guys can see the rest. <clears throat> just to give you a sense of some other voices rather than just scientists. So this is just one of the projects that we put together to start exploring adaptation by trying to reconstruct the past with not only traditional knowledge, but our uh, isotopic data, archeological data, and historical records. Okay, so I just want to bring us back to this particular case study and sum it up. So we know in kelp forests, there's strong evidence of tipping points and species interactions. You saw that with those hockey stick graphs. We know there are strong indirect effects and direct effects and those can elicit really strong trade-offs socially, culturally, and economically. And the example of this kind of workshop offers at least one solution for adaptation, and is that, that's that sharing of knowledge, the reconstruction of the past to get people to understand uh, what things might have looked like, governance practices, and even ecological implications of predator recovery. Okay, here's our second vignette. I now want to tell you about one of the most exciting discoveries that I made as a professor. I never thought that I would work in soft sediment areas. I came from rocky reef ecology. And um, this is one of the most exciting pieces of work I've done, and it's on ancient clam gardens. And I want to get a sense of how many people in this room know what a clam garden is. And OK, you, some of you can put up your hands because you heard about it. So, oh, some of you do know. Any new people? Ooh, a few. Many people don't. It's not surprising because these are new to science and yet they're thousands of years old. So let me tell you about this. You're looking at a clam garden. See that rock wall at the edge of the water? This was constructed by people thousands of years ago. People rocked, rolled rocks to the edge of the water and changed what were soft sediment beaches unaltered into terraces that look kind of like rice paddies underwater. So these are exposed only at low tide. These are um, those rock walls that are roughly between 0.75 and 1 meters above Canadian chart datum, which is a bit different than US chart datum. And you can see that flat area that's free of rocks behind there. That's a clam garden. Let me show you a few more pictures. Here's another one. This is one of the first clam gardens I ever canoed up to. There's the rock wall. You can just see it kind of sinusoidally following the contour of a bathymetry line. You can see that there. And here is another rock wall that's just getting submerged with the tide. And my student's just on the terrace itself. So the whole idea is that if you built a rock wall in the low inner tidal with simple tidal exchange and longshore current, Presumably, that might change the slope of these beaches to create a terrace. So that was a hypothesis put forward by John Harper and his colleagues who first discovered these in 1995. And the whole question is, well, if you built a rock wall, do you change the slope of the beach? And if you change the slope of the beach, do you get more clams? These things are monumental works of engineering. These are like underwater pyramids. Imagine moving that much rock. You just saw one clam garden. In that bay alone, there are 45 clam gardens. Clam gardens exist across British Columbia. They've been noted in um, Southeast Alaska, down into Washington. It's a huge amount of effort. 
So why would you bother putting that much effort unless you were going to gain, right? So here was our hypothesis. If you built this rock wall and you changed the slope of these terraces, did you actually increase the amount of real estate where clams grow and survive the best? And what you're looking at here is just a graph of our hypotheses. This is intertidal height, and this is the tidal height that we know clams do really well in, um, this, this area, thanks to some science and other people's work. So if you meet this flat beach, do you increase that red line? That was our hypothesis. So what we did is we transplanted a whole bunch of baby clams down a non-walled beach, and from the top down a clam garden beach. And I have to be honest with you, like I was this morning, I never thought this experiment was gonna work. But it was a master's, and I thought, might as well risk it. And lo and behold, it revealed one of the biggest discoveries I think that really has actually contributed monumentally to science. Okay, so this work was um, in Desolation Sound. We were just talking about Desolation Sound, one of the um, audience members and I just a little while ago. Here it is, sandwiched between Vancouver Island and the west coast of British Columbia on a fantastic island named Quadra. Quadra, named after the same explorer, Bodega y Quadra, Francisco de Bodega y Quadra, same guy, same Spanish explorer. And these bays are where we work, Wyatt and Canish Bay because they have the highest density of clam gardens, which is an experimentalist dream because there's all these experimental replicates. So we spent a lot of time sifting through sediment, collecting tiny little baby clams and tagging them. Here's just a small proportion of the over 800 clams we tagged. And then we made little beds for them and plopped them down into the sediment, just like I showed you in the last graph. And about six months later, in a chilly, chilly October low tide, we collected them. Now, for any of you that um, work tides in October, you know that they're in the middle of the night. So we were working, you know, between midnight and about 3 a.m. And we're really successful in collecting our tiny little transplanted clams. You can imagine how worried one is when one plants these things and goes back six months later. Will we find them? Well, we found almost all of them, but not all of them. And so I had to dive on some of them as well, these sites, and um, try and find our, our transplanted clams. And we managed to recover almost all of the transplants. I also managed to get pneumonia. You can see my blue lips there. The university used this as, as a promotional picture, and I just laughed because I really did get pneumonia from this trip. Um, so. But here are the results. Okay, so what you're looking at here are in green, clam garden density of clams in clam gardens versus the blue are the non-wall beaches. And you're looking at the number of clams at different size classes, little babies, teenagers, and more like adults. And what you can see is generally we have a higher proportion of clams in the clam gardens versus the non-wall beaches. And if you look at our little hypothesis about being at the top of the clam bed versus the bottom of the clam bed, this is the data you see here. So this is little net clam density from the top of the beach down to the bottom. In green, the clam gardens, and in blue, the non-wall beaches. And you can see we just get higher densities pretty consistently in the clam gardens, especially up high. And then in the middle and down low, there's a bit of a difference. Clam gardens can increase the density of little nook clams between two and fourfold. That's the same for butter clams. And these numbers have been reproduced in other areas up around the central coast. So I spent a lot of time trying to understand why this was the case. This is a picture of me and my dad on the beach of Tofino drawing hypotheses in the sand. And th literally, this was in December. And I went back and I said to my grad student, Amy, OK, this is how I want you to plot the data. And this is what came out, which was pretty amazing. Um, here's little like clam growth. So this is how fast our little baby clams that we transplanted grew per day. In green, the clam gardens, and in blue, the non-wall beaches. So not only were the clam gardens m more productive in green here, they were always also kind of squished in that intertidal height, where, that real estate where clams grow and survive the best. But 
it's not just about the ecology. Of course, these systems interacted within a cultural context. And this work really was initially led by my good friend and colleague and mentor, Dana Leposky, an archeologist, and a team of uh, local community members, students, and a geomorphologist, Kirsten Rell. Here's Canish Bay and here's Wyatt Bay. In yellow, you see clam gardens and in red archeological sites. Huge evidence of the human alteration of coastal ecosystems here. These are high, high densities. Let me take you to one of these sites. So from air, you can just see that clam garden rock wall. And if you look landward of that rock wall, you can see another terrace, but on land, which was surprising. And if you pop down on this point and have a look, this is what it looks like. Here's the clam garden that's getting flooded by water. And here's this upper terrace. And see all this white stuff here? That's all shell eroding from this midden. That midden is filled with shell from shucked clams from these clam gardens that these community, these coastal indigenous communities used as fill, construction fill, on which to build their villages. And if you take a look at this map of the same, same site, there's the clam garden. There's that upper level terrace. You can see other features uh, along the beach, including, including some canoe slides. Um, and this, this particular site is dated around 660, 70 calendar um, years BP. And we've just gotten some radiocarbon dates that are a little bit older than that. And there's some sites in the Gulf Islands, clam garden sites that are even older than that still. Um, we think that many other sites probably exist. They're probably submerged underwater now because of the big changes in sea level associated with isostatic rebound on our coast. The other thing that's pretty amazing about these gardens is all of the ethnographic evidence associated with the governance protocols associated with them. So certainly they were engineered features by people, but they were also managed with complex rules. So this is a quote from Davy Wilson, a Heltzik First Nation member who says, we transplanted clams in the garden so we didn't have to go very far. Only certain families own clam gardens and the whole family would look after it. And this simple quote identifies a couple of things. One, this whole notion of adjacency, that coastal communities are reliant on adjacent resources because of limitations on transportation, even now with fuel costs and this whole notion of what Davy here calls ownership and what scholars often call contingent proprietorship. The reason they use the word proprietorship is that in the past, people couldn't sell what was a family territory. So they were proprietors over these areas. And that proprietorship was contingent on their sustainable use of these resources demonstrated by our potlatch governance system. So many of you probably know in the potlatch, chiefs would give away resources. This wasn't uh, just a benevolent thing. This was demonstrating that you could manage your resources and had the wealth associated with that good management. And your management and proprietorship of these areas was contingent on your ability to be able to feed not only your family, but also to provide insurance, if you will, in your bank account for reciprocity of, of resources. If your river or a clam garden or a chunk of ocean was doing poorly for whatever reason, other families that might have received benefits from you in the, in the past would then be beholden to provide you with resources as well. And that notion of reciprocity and contingent proprietorship are some of the key components, I think, to adapting to external shocks to systems and big changes like tipping points. Okay, so this work um, around Canish and Quadra on Quadra Bay, we, we replicated this work up on the central coast where you just were earlier with the sea otters. And what I wanna show you is that it's not just about clam gardens actually. If you open up your eyes beyond just clam gardens, which you are seeing one version of one here underwater, a very big one, you can just see the rock wall here. You can also see a little canoe slide here. If you open your eyes, you see much more than clam gardens on the landscape or seascape. You can see stone fish traps. Here's one right here. You can just see these V's. See those two V's? Um, those were used to corral five different species of salmon that we have in BC. 
and lots of ethnographies also describe the protocols associated with that management practice. Culturally modified trees, spatial management depicted by these pictographs that you can only see if I color enhance this photograph, and estuarine root gardens. I, I used to scratch my head about these. I didn't really get it um, until I learned more about the importance of roots. There are various plants, camas, Pacific silverweed and clover that have roots that are high in sugars and carbohydrates. And those were one of the major carbohydrates that were used, consumed, and also traded by indigenous communities. And you can see that people made little terraces at just the right heights also for these um, root gardens. And there are evidence still on the landscape of them. So there was actually a portfolio of use and management associated with all of these coastal nearshore habitats. So let me sum up with ancient clam gardens. They're certainly a classic example, a beautiful example of an adaptive strategy that can enhance food security. This whole notion of contingent proprietorship and reciprocity, I think these are some key principles for adapting to change. And this whole notion of a portfolio of use. Um, and management approaches. In terms of use, you can just imagine if you have uh, an occupation that allows you to um, change between different, slightly different variations in that occupation. Let's take fishing, for example. If you can take, change fishing gears, then you can respond to a system. That, that, that notion is called occupational multiplicity by social scientists. That's another um, form of adapting to change that allows you to adapt to change. Okay, now on to our final case study, Pacific herring. Okay, there are many, many predators that eat um, herring um, or are harvested by, um, that harvest herring. What you're looking at here at are coastal wolves that are foraging on herring roe or eggs that have been deposited in the intertidal on fucus, here rockweed. Um, a variety of different birds, not only gulls, but surf scoters, uh, um, white-winged scoters, all sorts of diving ducks benefit from the eggs of these pelagic fish that come in in the spring and spawn in the near shore. And of course, people. Um, there's a variety of different fisheries in British Columbia. There's a seine and a gillnet fishery, and there's a traditional artisanal and subsistence fishery where First Nations um, put substrates in the water. Right here, you're seeing giant kelp, macrocystis, that's put it in the water. And they also put in hemlock, uh, and other kelps like um, agresia, the feather boa kelp, and the herring come and spawn on it. And this is what it looks like. This is agresia, um, or the feather boa kelp, yagya, as it's known in Heltzik, that's being harvested by Connie Newman and Elder. And here, Jordan Wilson is bringing up macrocystis, and this is what the blades look like. Um, and, and if you look at archaeological data from across British Columbia, so these are all archaeological sites that are at least 2,500 years old, and you look at the relative proportion of different fish bones in those middens, you can see that there is a high proportion of herring that are caught. It's not just salmon that were caught. In fact, herring um, are so culturally important to local communities. That being said, herring biomass on our coast um, they're not doing particularly well, uh, especially within three management eras. You can see in the last decade these declining trends in urchin biomass. So what that's led to is major conflict on our coast. In 2015, we had a major herring crisis, and there was great debate over the population estimates of herring, how many fish were actually out in the ocean. Um, the spatial dimension at which these fish populations operate and are fished by the various fishing fleets and the management approach used by our federal fisheries and oceans um, department. And what you're seeing here are some pictures of that conflict where the Heltzik Nation actually occupied the DFO office to try and make change. So what can science do to help with a crisis like this? We can try and inform some of these uncertainties. So one of the first things that we tried to inform was what local people had observed, and that was a big change in the spawning behavior of herring. Many, many people told us that herring um, were spawning in fewer places and in different places. 
Now, if any of you have seen a herring spawn, and how many of you have seen a herring spawn? Well, now you've all seen a herring spawn. Okay, it's remarkable. The ocean turns this milky white color, that sperm you're seeing in the water, it's amazing. For about a day and a half, two days, it'll look like this. And then the current will wash it away. But these are very observable events, right? It's kind of hard to miss a herring spawn. So the first thing we did is we documented with maps people's observation of herring spawn in their territory where they've lived all their lives. And these are some of the maps of the 30 respondents decade by decade. And I'm just flashing through them to show you this is the trend in the total kilometers of herring spawn, um, coastline of herring spawn at that decade by decade level. And you can see there's roughly an 8% decline per decade, but there was also a decrease in the diversity of habitat used. So there's been a contraction in the spatial extent of herring spawn. Beyond trying to model some of the population dynamics of the herring, which any of you can ask me about after the talk, we also tried to simultaneously quantify the resilience of this social ecological system. I started off this talk by, by sharing with you the complex dynamics of social ecological systems. They're very, very hard to try and measure. And they're not measured often. And this is one of the first simultaneous attempts at measuring resilience of this social ecological system, this herring social ecological system. And now let me tell you how we did it. And this is my last story. Um, we spent a lot of time in workshops with local elders and fishermen from these First Nations communities on the Central Coast. And we identified different governance regimes as a function of the herring fishery and major disturbance events through time that influenced local people's ability to actually govern herring. So we came up with these three governance regimes, this indigenous governments period, a time of colonial control, and a time of environmental and social justice that was initiated by a big court case that changed the way we manage herring. And then we tried to measure some of the key variables of re resilience, the key components of resilience, described by a woman named um, Onzi Biggs. And she described these seven components, um, a mix of ecological and social components that really describe a system's resilience to change. And we changed these fancy scientific words into very clear, common language, jargon-free questions. And we spoke with over 30 herring experts from these First Nation villages. And what I'm gonna show you now is a diagram of those seven principles through those three governance regime periods. So it looks like a spider web. So here are the seven principles by Onzi Biggs. And here are three governance eras, this indigenous governance era, the colonial control era, and this environmental justice era, here as these kind of webs within the web. The pattern that your eyes are probably all fixating on is the contraction from the blue, the indigenous governance era, to the red and the green. An overall decline in quantitatively of resilience given these factors we measured. But you're probably also noticing some slight little recoveries recently in the green. So let me walk you through this graph. Certainly people reported a decrease in the diversity of species within the system and habitats. That was also reflected in some of the data you just saw earlier. There's been a decrease in the perspectives and the occupations associated with herring and a decrease in the response of herring to big changes and the decline in their size structure. And that's all actually reflected in DFO data itself. Um, we're seeing big truncation in the age distribution. All that means is we're seeing lots of little guys, not a lot of the big guys. There's been in the last few years, and that's why you see this green surpassing the red, much more inc uh, increased communication and sharing of scientific resources, which is quite a hopeful sign that People are seeing that as one component of the system that's changing in a positive way. We're also seeing an increase in the distribution of 
authority and decision making. Uh, local communities are participating more, not a lot more, but a little bit more in some of the management. And the use and integration of traditional knowledge is one way by which that's happening, um, like the study I just showed you earlier. Because some of the DFO, Department of Fisheries and Oceans managers, are starting to listen to some of these alternative data sources, they're exhibiting a little bit more willingness for conflict resolution, and that's a really positive thing. And yet at the same time, herring are still declining. They're still very low biomass relative to historic records. So there still is um, a lack of trust um, and a lack of participation and cooperation in the actual co-management of the species. So let me sum up the Pacific herring fishery story. Um, we've documented asymmetry and risk of overfishing, um, mismatch in the scale of management with the ecological and social processes that are driving this social ecological system. And there certainly is an inequitable distribution of power and authority and decision making that still exists. So, so given that, given what we've learned from ancient clam gardens, given what we've learned from kelp forests, what are three major points that I can share with you that might be a little bit unique and um, draw on the original question, set of questions that I brought up with you at the beginning of this talk? What actually enables adaptation by social ecological systems when you have big change? And these are the final three thoughts I thought I'd leave you with. First off, the diversity and the this diverse portfolio of use and management approaches is one thing that enables adaptation. It increases the redundancy in the system and the, the diversity of responses given a perturbation, given a shock, given a disturbance. And that example I gave of occupational multiplicity, the ability to change jobs, for instance, given a big change in international markets or even resource availability, that allows people to cope with change. Nested governance systems. Hmm, you're probably wondering what's she getting at here. This whole idea of um, matching the scales of management to the scales at which ecological processes happen and social processes happen, I think is critical. And one way that you can try and do that is by having nested governing authorities that can do just that, and here's how. Um, you brought in participation not only of local people, but of scientists that might have important information at a local scale. Uh, and that involves not only sharing information, but authority in decision making. And so you can capitalize on scale specific knowledge. And finally, I'll end off with the learning platforms and just get you thinking a little bit about that video and bringing all of these diverse people together with a very diverse training, skill set, knowledge, and values, and how by doing that, it was an amazing source of innovation, um, source of historical data that can cure this whole notion of sliding baselines and allowed people to start thinking about change and a source of innovation, like I just said. So those are the three points I wanna leave you with, and with that, I'll say thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt for a minute. As some of, some of you know who have uh, participated in our events before, um, we go from our speaker to a panel of our students. Um, as I hope many of you know, we're part of San Francisco State University, and we have graduate programs and undergraduate students who study here. So we're going to go on to a learning platform. Good. <laughs> um, and we're going to bring up two of our wonderful students to uh, interview Anne for a few minutes. And then after that, we're going to open up the floor for all of you uh, to ask Anne some questions as well about what she's just presented. I want to introduce you to two of our graduate students, Anne Holmes uh, and Serena Civilian, and they have uh, thought a little bit about what Anne has been working on, and um, we're going to ask her a few questions. So I'm going to pass the microphone to them and let them take over the show. So um, first of all, um, thank you for the important work you're doing um, and for sharing it with RTC um, and our local community. It's been really great. Um, so to start off, um, I'm really interested in 
um, how you got your start as a scientist, um, and you know what um, what really sparked your interest in studying the links between humans and the ocean. Um, if there were any defining moments that were sort of your tipping points as a as a marine scientist. Okay, I have a surprising answer for you. So you asked me um, what got me started in this whole realm of social ecological systems? The US exchange rate. <laughs> Seriously, I was a Canadian student with a Canadian scholarship and I had just started at University of Washington at the time that the Canadian dollar was worth 62 cents to your dollar. And so my scholarship went almost in half and one of my advisors on my very first week in Seattle um, slammed an application for a scholarship down on my table to work in Alaska. And he said, fill this out to supplement your third world country income. <laughs> and I'm, I remember that quote. And so I filled it out and I got it and it ended up being, get this, at National Estuarine Research Reserve Scholarship to Kachemak Bay, Alaska. So I headed up to Alaska and I was a floundering first year PhD student working up there in the intertidal. And um, I was working as most intertidal ecologists do with your head down and your back facing the ocean. And I looked up and I noticed there was a native village where we were doing some of our surveys. And in Canada, one needs to ask permission for First Nations people to work in their territories. And so I went and I talked to the chiefs and I asked them, can I do these intertidal surveys in your communities? And they said, yes. And I didn't have a lot of resources. I, I needed help. And they helped the poor little graduate student. They boated me around. They helped me um, screw in my little settling plates. You know, I mean, it was amazing. And when we were traveling to and from sites, and they were really helping this you know, floundering first year PhD student, I was listening to them. And the stories they told, the knowledge they had of the system was unbelievable. They were marine ecologists and it dawned on me that at the time I was learning probably more from them than my committee, media, my committee down in Seattle. <coughs> um, so, so that's how I started realizing that local people um, had an amazing amount of place-based knowledge that they themselves were scientists. Uh, many of them had done transplant experiments. They'd experimented. They'd actually done little tests and that was amazing. Um, so that's your first question. Your second question, um, was there a pivotal moment in, in that time that really hooked me into this work? And there was, and I can, I'll tell you exactly when it was. It was about two years after that, in the same place on the tip of the Kenai in, uh, Port Graham and Nanwalak, Alaska. These are two Sukpiak tribes. Um, Karina mentioned um, the work we did together. And I was traveling in a skiff with an elder named Nick Tanapi Sr. Um, he was and still is a seal hunter, um, a knowledge holder in the area and taught me how to drive a skiff in Alaska. And we'd been working together in the field, um, monitoring the density of these tiny little chitons that Karina mentioned, the black katie chiton, the leather chiton, you have them here, we have them in BC. They're a major food source for not only uh, sea otters, but for people in Alaska. And they had noticed declines in the density numbers. And we had we were just pulling up um, to Nanwalek. Nanwalek doesn't have a boat ramp or a dock. It has a lagoon that you can only get into at high water. So I, I was pulling the boat into the shore and Nick was gonna hop the bow of the boat. And just as we were pulling in, he said, you know, Anne, years ago, people didn't just go for chitons. We were trying to figure out why they were declining, right? Why there were fewer of them. We had everything available on the shore. Urchins, mussels, clams. Now they're declining. Sea otters are just like humans and they'll change their diet. And now, Badarkis, this chitin, that's the only thing we can get from this shore now. And that's almost a direct quote from Nick. I remember I was driving the boat. He was just about to jump off. And that's when we both had this aha moment. There had been this serial decline of invertebrates, probably driven by both human harvest and sea otters. And 
we would have never figured that out just with contemporary data, without local knowledge, without archaeological data that we had. And that was a turning point for me that influenced probably why I am sitting here doing this kind of work now. I never planned on it. I have no formal training in social science. I collaborate a lot with social scientists. But that, for me, was the pivotal moment. Well, thank you again for your incredible talk. So your work has really highlighted how indigenous people were capable of practicing sustainable and successful mariculture. Have you given any thought or can you comment on how these practices can be incorporated in mariculture today? And then on top of that, uh, it's also been shown through your work that indigenous people had this really strong connection to their natural world. and and we're capable of such wonderful things. And how do you think that generations today are capable of incorporating and facilitating this connection? Okay, let's, let's get that first one first. Um, yeah, the, the whole, the evidence around clam gardens is pretty remarkable. Y these things more than double clam production. Um, and people figured this out a long time ago, but they figured it out through trial and error. Um, they didn't get it right the first time, I doubt. Um, just like in fisheries management, we don't get it right the first time. We have to, and I talked about this earlier today, we have to fail in, in order to succeed, right? So I'm not attempting to pr you know, promote this um, perfect picture of the past or indigenous ways. What I'm trying to describe is essentially uh, thousands of years of of experimenting, learning, and adapting, and trying to figure it out because this this was their life. It was a matter of life or death. Um, I also shared earlier today that in terms of those clam gardens, um, a lot of them are at this particular tidal height where clams seem to grow really, really well. But there's one that's quite a bit higher. It's noticeably higher. And myself and Dana Leposky, we also often call that the engineering error. You know, they probably got that one wrong. Um, unless, the, you know, there's other hypotheses that, as to why that one's higher. Maybe it was for a different species, maybe, who knows. Um, but that process of learning, just like we, we all learn, is, is essential. But I, I do think, and it's not just me, there are many people, um, colleagues of mine that think similarly, that there is a wealth of information um, from the past that really can provide innovative solutions for today. Uh, if you haven't read Wade Davis's book, The Wayfinders, I highly encourage it. That's the tagline of his book. He, he was a National Geographic Explorer and resident. He's an ethnobiologist now at UBC. And you know he talks about the navigational techniques that the Polynesians had. They figured out how to calculate latitude before Europeans did, right? I mean, it is, it, there is some amazing technology that was figured out. So I do think that we should learn from that. So that was your first question. Your second question, ah, how do we use this today? I, I absolutely think we should use it today and there's really good examples of it. For the clam gardens, for example, um, there's a, a current restoration of two clam gardens that are happening in British Columbia, um, bringing elders, First Nations, non-First Nations, kids of all sorts together to the beach to reconstruct these clam gardens. Uh, and a student of mine, Sky Augustine, she's Hulkaminum. Um, she's a PhD student, a marine scientist, an indigenous woman, and a leader. And she is studying the um, ecological implications of these clam gardens, learning the quantitative tools, learning the math, um, and integrating that local knowledge. So it's happening now, which is fantastic. And that's just one example. Um, I'll just name one other example. That herring work I showed you, um, stock assessments for Pacific herring in Alaska and in British Columbia, one of the key parameters that's used is the egg loss rate um, after eggs are deposited on the shore. Because we, it's, it's not easy to go and measure adult biomass out there of herring because they aggregate, we often use their spawn to estimate the biomass of the mums and dads who spawn those eggs. But we need to know the rate at which they're lost to predation, to waves, that kind of thing. And 
we used a traditional harvest practice that you saw a picture of that um, spun on kelp fishery to estimate, to, to conduct an experiment to estimate egg loss rates and ask how does predation and wave exposure influence those rates. And that's in one little example of how we can use practices from the past to actually inform science today as well. And those are two little examples and I think there are many, many more. So I think it, it takes a little bit of risk because it's not generally done. Um, but I think the risk is worth the reward. Um, so many of us are interested in the impacts of climate change uh, on marine ecosystems. And um, we already know that climate change has devastated some major ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about um, you know, the impacts um, and you know, potential future risks um, to kelp forests, um, rocky intertidal, and, and other shorelines um, along our coast and, and the coast of British Columbia. Um, and perhaps if you've observed um, any resiliency um, that might be surprising um, and that might give us hope for the future. So I, th I think there's, there's empirical data and there's modeling data to suggest that climate change impacts are going to be quite um, observable, pronounced, and felt by coastal communities. Um, some colleagues of mine at the University of British Columbia have just made projections about major um, fish and shellfish resources. It's work by William Chung and his graduate students, um, and the, the proportion at which they will be less available up and down our coast, and they're significant. Um, those are species that typically live in the area. You do see increases in some species that typically don't to the same extent as they do here. Sardine, for example, are uh, projected to occupy um, a northward rain shift and be more accessible to coastal communities in British Columbia. Um, you know, one species that they projected would be little affected are clams, lo and behold. And, and actually, um, they suggest that we should be considering these kinds of clam gardens to increase their production. So there is an example that kind of ties both of your questions together. Um, I, d I do think that communities, ecosystems, uh, ecological communities, and social systems can be quite resilient and can build resiliency. And I think it's worth putting effort into figuring out what are the kind of key things that do and learn from other communities that have shown that resilience. At the same time, there are a lot of species that are really sensitive to temperature, and I'll just share with you some data from a wonderful postdoc of mine, Kira Crumhansel, that did a large uh, kelp harvest experiment. I didn't have time to show you today. This is in collaboration with the Health Sick First Nation. And the good news is she saw at this kind of relatively small scale that Macrocystis giant kelp is actually really um, robust to harvest. So you get really high recovery rates because tiny new little fronds pop up from the ground if you cut off a little bit. Do you imagine pruning your bushes outside? You give them a little prune, sometimes you can stimulate growth, right? So that's a good news story. The flip side of that story is macrocystis is very sensitive to temperature differences. So she looked at recovery rates um, along the central coast where there was a temperature dif differential bet among I think it was seven sites that was less than a degree Celsius, and she saw significant decreases in the recovery rates of those kelp forests in uh, areas that were slightly warmer. So that good news story is cautioned with the reality that slight changes in ocean temperature are probably going to affect those recovery rates. So um, we need to we need to watch for that. And as you know, there's some students that here that I heard today that are studying the blob and right the changes in our ocean temperatures and that, that is going to be influencing recovery rates of things to disturbances, whether they be harvest or whether they be any any kind of thing, a predator coming back or what have you. All right, and for our last question of the evening, a lot of your work is highlighted specifically with the First Nations, how community involvement can be really successful and important when you're trying to plan coastal resource protection. How do you feel and how can you comment on how large coastal communities such as areas like the Bay Area can be more involved in resource protection and planning? Right. Um, so I suspect that um, you guys and many of us in this room are really um, 
goal oriented. You like to see things happen. I do. I like to see products happen. But what I've realized over maybe 41, almost two years of life is that in fact, process really matters. And um, it used to worry me that one can get mired in process, but if one has um, really clear objectives, clear timelines, and have involved people enough in the design of the process that there's enough buy-in that in, in fact it can be so useful because ultimately your product's gonna be way better. Now, you're right that most of my work has been done in small communities um, up and down BC's coast, and I haven't tried to do any marine spatial planning in Vancouver or is a place such as San Francisco Bay. That would be a big challenge, but I think there's enough local grassroots organizations and NGOs, many of which I suspect some of you are in this room, that are, I don't know, what can you say, like keystone people, you know, those people, the few key people, you get the right key people involved that can get the other right key people involved. And if you want to be involved, you're involved. If you're not involved, that's okay. And, you know, really clear objectives and those timelines, I think that you can do it at a larger scale. But I'm also kind of an internal uh, optimist. It's probably trickier. Polycentric governance, nested scales. Go for nested scales. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I think we're going to be opening it up to the crowd. So. Um, before we do that, I want to give a round of applause to uh, Anne and our students. Thank you all for, and thank you, Anne, for a really terrific talk. Um, I wanted to also uh, uh, just take a moment to thank uh, um, Barbara and Richard Rosenberg who have brought you this wonderful speaker and the opportunity to come here. Uh, they've endowed the speaker series, so thanks to Barbara and Dick. <laughs> and now I'd like to uh, open up the uh, floor to questions from the audience. And um, if you just raise your hand, we'll bring a microphone over and you can ask your questions. Oh, okay, so uh, these clam gardens are about 2,500 to 3,000 years old, uh, but the people occupied the area for 12,000 years. Is there any cultural or technological change other than the, the gardens themselves that coincide with the period of their being built? Yeah, that is a great question. So the oldest radiocarbon date we have right now is 1,400 years old for the clam gardens. It's really hard to date a clam garden. They're made of rock. And you know we need organic carbon to get those radiocarbon dates. So they're using barnacle scars in the rocks to get those dates. So about 1,400 years old. That being said, there could be older ones underwater. <clears throat> How old, we don't know yet. To answer your your second main question, which is a really good question, what was the change in technology that might have limited the technological discovery or use of these clam gardens, given that people operated in this area for 12,000 years, right? Which is which is true. And in fact, some of the I think the most recent radiocarbon dates from the Central Coast bring us to 13,500 years now in BC. I'm going to take the best stab I can at this, and I'm going to cite Ron Trosper, who um, is a social scientist, anthropologist, a little bit archaeologist, who was at UBC at a time, but is now at Arizona State. And he um, used a combination of archaeological records and ethnographic records to identify the, a governance period in deep time around 2,500 years ago where that potlatch system where established communities that had you know, complex social structure existed. Prior to that, there might have been less of that um, structure in terms of governance. People might have been moving more um, and, and so 
That's the only thing I can give you is that it seems like archaeologically there's consistent records in uh, use, uh, continual use of sites, uh, consistent records of use of different species of sites, and then some evidence of, of governance protocols that were in place where these civilizations seem to, you know, if you will, have some kind of social tipping point around that time. Yeah. That's, that's the extent of my knowledge. Maybe does anyone else here have any other knowledge on that? It's a really interesting question. up uh, nuances of causality in the first two examples. Obviously, more otters led to reduced invertebrates in some sense, and in the second one, building these rock platforms led to more clams. But I didn't get any of that causality stuff in the herring example. Is there something which yes. will make me understand more what's going on with the herring? I think the burning question that everyone wants to know and what you're getting at is what's causing the decline in herring. I don't have enough evidence to tell you that or a quantitative model or test that I've done specifically, but other people are working on that. What's tricky is this is a multi multiple causation situation. Um, clearly, harvest has, is one of the factors that driving that spatial variation in herring spawn. Um, because so much har harvest of adult herring was happening on the exposed outer coast. However, at the same time, you've got changes in um, oceanographic conditions, some of which are natural, uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, El Nino events, and what have you, some of which are more human-induced. Um, you also have an increase in natural predators like seals, sea lions, whales. So um, an increase in competitors of sardine um, and anchovy. And so depending on who you ask, you'll get really strong different opinions. And I haven't seen a compelling piece of science yet that has actually really tried to identify the smoking gun or even detect the major causal factors is probably a combination of all of those and we haven't actually tried to do that although it is a burning question I think for many people we've actually tried to kind of look forward instead of behind us try and improve population estimates and um, and improve the management given what we know of the situation now um, but it certainly is a question on a lot of people's minds I'll let you know as soon as those papers do come out. I myself haven't done them. Um, the, the, the areas you showed um, seem to be um, very uh, rainy areas as well as uh, coastal. Yes. And, and have any of your studies uh, addressed uh, impacts of runoff from mm. logging or agricultural uses? No, but you're absolutely right. These are very, very rainy areas. In fact, some people call it the rain coast. We do get some sun. I get sunburn in the summer when I'm out there. But um, I have really good wet weather gear, so you're absolutely right. Um, other scientists are studying the effects of variation in runoff. Um, some of which are studying the effects on, on pH, actually, and how that's influencing the pH in, in the sounds. Um, it's not something that I'm focused on, but it certainly is an interesting question. Um, there's a big project that's happening on the Central Coast that's um, doing something really neat that's addressing that. So you know how, you've probably heard of salmon forests. So when these salmon come up river and they die after they spawn and birds and grizzly bears and black bears um, bring the carcasses into the forest, all of that carbon and nitrogen fuel production in the forests. Well, not only that, with runoff, just like you're describing, dissolved organic carbon from forests flush out into the ocean. And you see that when you're going up and down the coast with all that um, 
the tannins, that tea-like water that's coming out of the rivers. And so people are now trying to study what that contribution of carbon is to the marine system um, as part of a collaboration with a group I'm, I'm working with, but I'm not particularly involved in that project. The data will be coming out, so I could let you know in probably a year or two what they're finding there, because it is a big component of coastal systems, that export of carbon, even though we typically think about the import from uh, of nitrogen and carbon by salmon to forests. It does go both ways. Uh, much of what you, what I take away is observational science, very well done. But I'm, I think we're, many of us are more interested in the policy ramifications. Can you come up with some conclusions that affect policy that would be presented, say, to your governing agencies? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the practical implications of what you've done in terms of putting something into practice? Great question. Okay, let me give you one example from the kelp forest work. You know how I showed you data that described the indirect and direct effects of sea otters on abalone? Um, m much like here in California, our abalone and sea otters are um, sea otters are recovering from depletion in the past. So they were listed as endangered species. Now they're listed in Canada as a species of special concern. So they're on our Species at Risk Act, like um, the U.S. Endangered Species Act. So are this their major one of their major prey, northern abalone, which actually uh, is the only um, endangered inver invertebrate on our Species at Risk Act. Right now, those recovery plans are completely separate, and it makes little sense that they're completely separate. And really, what should be happening is that these recovery plans be considered in terms of a policy set of guidelines together, given the dynamics between this predator and prey. So there's one example. Um, another example from herring um, that I talked a little bit about earlier today. The spatial management at which herring is happening now is on the region scale. That's why I showed you those five time series or data through time of different stocks, management stocks in British Columbia. And yet what we're finding is that the risk of overfishing is really felt um, and observed uh, to a greater extent at the local scale, at uh, the substock scale. And so right now, I think the policy, major policy implications of that is that the management of these herring needs to be done at a nested scale with the small scale as importantly considered as that large scale. So what that means is that local management in the communities need to actually have um, some authority and decisions when it comes to harvesting in local areas rather than having a blanket regional total allowable catch because the scale at which the ecology is happening and then the, the dynamics of the social system is happening at that local scale. So I think one bit of policy advice I would give to the managers that are managing that fishery is to con really consider these multiple scales of management um, and not having just a total allowable catch for a specific region. These regions are massive. But as you know, the coastline of British Columbia is a large coastline, and just having these total allowable catches in those regions, I think, is to the deficit of the fish and the fishermen. So those are two examples. Yeah. I too got um, the uh, Press Democrat article about the, the um, sea urchin barrens and the decline in our kelp forest and was completely horrified. And of course, my first reaction was like, well, we need otter reintroduced into these places where they, where they. And yet I sense this, this sense, almost a sense of ambivalence about the resurgence of the otter oh, yeah. in your, you know, where, where you have it resurging. Yep. Um, and so, um, can, you Can I reconcile that? that? Yeah, right. So 
here, what I gather scientists like Dr. Laura Rogers Bennett, Mark Carr, and others, I'm not sure who else was cited in that Press Democrat article, but I know those two were, I'm sure there are more, I'm sorry if I've neglected you, um, what it sounds like is happening is there is um, very rapid decline in kelp, and abalone feed on drift kelp primarily. Um, so do urchins, they feed actively on kelp, but also on drift kelp. And so when there's not a lot of kelp around, um, you see evidence of starvation. And I, I suspect that that's what's happening, although the data I think actually aren't published yet from this big change, but that's what I gather is happening. You'd have to ask your local ep experts for sure. And so you're right, um, if we want more kelp, one surefire way to do that is to decrease the number of urchins. And you can do that with an urchin fishery and you can do it with sea otters coming back because they are very good at and quickly eating a lot of urchins. At the same time, in British Columbia right now, we actually have pretty healthy neurocystis beds that are pumping out carbon um, drift kelp for a lot of different invertebrates. So when you get used to having a hyperabundance of shellfish because a major predator has been gone for over 250 years, you get used to that as your baseline. A high, high density of urchins and a high, high density of abalone that get you get used to. And so as soon as that becomes threatened, you worry about it. But worse, and I think this is the, the issue really, is if you have no ability to affect a decision, then you're powerless and you have even more fear. But if you have information, information about some of those indirect effects, the benefits of having otters around and having some kelp, and yet are really honest about the direct negative effects because boy, do they happen. And if you see an area where there's been otters for 50 years, you will not be able to harvest food for your family to the same extent as you could. And if you can't go very far, that is, Im you know, imagine not being able to put dinner on your plate for your kids. Now that I have a child, I, you know, really understand that's an issue. So being very honest with those issues is very important. And when you don't have that honesty or an ability to affect change, then you're powerless. So I think as soon as you share information and you share, you think about sharing authority and decision making, which is another policy recommendation I would make in British Columbia and other places, the importance of co-management, the importance of having local communities and federal organizations co-manage a fishery, that's going to buy you huge mileage. And, you know, one of the take home messages from the workshop that you guys got a little glimmer into is when you have these really, really strong regime shifts, you can't have kelp forests and urchins ran, uh, urchin barrens right beside each other with and without these predators or a commercial urchin fishery, right? You, you really have these strong kind of alternate states. That's on one patch of rocky reef, but you can imagine across various patches of rocky reef, if you had the ability to control otters, exclude them, whether it's through hunting and directly killing them, or if you listen to the documentary, there's some other really interesting ideas on what people could try and do. If you had some control to manage some places, then you probably would be less fearful. And that's why Bonnie McKay, a uh, social scientist you saw in the yellow jacket in that movie, the documentary, is basically identifying that the reassertion of territorial use rights by indigenous communities would probably be um, one way to try and manage this issue. And guess what? This was done thousands of years ago. This is how it was done. Um, many famous scientists, that conservation marine ecologists that Karina and Ellen and I work with, I'm thinking specifically of Steve Gaines and others at UCSB where I did my postdoc, they're coming up with evidence now to show how important designated access privileges or um, having designated access to fisheries in place helps deal with th some of these management issues. And yet that is something that was done thousands of years ago on these coasts. And you can see the pictographs that identify family territorial use rights. So I think those are some of the, the solutions. They're not easy. Some people will lose and some people will gain um, in space if you had a mosaic of, of areas. And that's why I think the whole notion of reciprocity really matters, right? that kind of trade that happened. And you see evidence of that trade um, in, the, in the archeological record. For example, you can see <coughs> um, 
evidence of animals from the interior in coastal middens. You see red abalone in some of our coastal middens. We don't have red abalone up in British Columbia. There was trade of red abalone thousands of kilometers up and down this coast. All those clams that were produced in Quadra Bay um, that I showed you, they weren't all locally consumed. They were dried and they were like silver dollars, right? So that kind of trade of resourcing and resources and that reciprocity, um, those are some, some key features that, you know, how do you instill reciprocity and in governance systems now? I'm not entirely sure. So I, I think we need to think of creative ways of doing it. But that's why I think we can learn a lot from the past. And, you know, ironically, here we are publishing papers in Science and Nature saying, well, one of the innovations we should have are designated access purposes, territorial use rights for fishing. And I'll shut up in a second, but there is evidence of them being very useful in Baja, California. Um, uh, Fiorenza McKelly at Stanford at Hopkins here is working with Bonnie McKay on that um, and others. Um, examples from Chile. The the equivalent, the caletas of Juan Carlos Castilla and others that are doing exactly the same thing. They're locally managed areas of some of these nearshore resources, which are much like the resources we have here, um, or Southern California, spiny lobster, abalone, reef-associated rockfish. So I, I think there's a lot that we can learn from these, these territorial use rights. Getting on and late, um, uh, we will uh, thank Anne again for a really wonderful presentation. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Um, if you need a cup of coffee before you go, you're welcome to stay for a minute and grab that. And uh, hope we'll see you again soon. I wanted to let everybody know also this Sunday is our open house here, uh, our annual discovery day from 1 to 5 p.m. If you'd like to come by and see a little bit more about the work that we do down in the labs, uh, bring your families. It'll be a fun day. Um, thanks for coming. We'll see you again soon.